Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to Bust a Recap. I am Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, today with... I'm Aaron Matthews. The one and only licensed henchman that is known to this channel. And today, it being... God, it's it's Turkey Day weekend, isn't it? Yep. Oh God, yeah, we're freaking Turkey Day. Yep, so, to celebrate the day of the most white appropriation, or at least the week of white appropriation, the definition... Love you, Columbus. I really do. I mean that. I guess. Um, we are going to be talking about some stuff that happened over the weekend. Ah, that's right. The henchman is, what is the term, brimming with excitement. <laughs> what? Stuff over the weekend. We've got Justice League stuff yeah, to talk yeah. about. Um, Saw the movie. Got yeah. It. Jason um, Jason Statham actually hit the scene doing some stuff this weekend. We're going to talk about that. And uh, we're going to talk about some gaming stuff because, well, gaming stuff is actually kind of fun. What I got to do now is, yeah, I'm turning down. I hope my levels are okay now. I'm looking at stuff, and I'm like, yeah, it's peaking. No, it's peaking. And that is only good if you're on LSD from what I remember from the 1980s. So today, how you been, man? How you been? I'm doing pretty good. Hanging in there. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, and I totally forgot for all the Instagrams and all that other stuff. If you want to reach me and give me some show ideas or let me know what you think, or if you just want to tell me that I'm full of crap and I dare you to subscribe so you can do that, you can find us on the YouTubes at BidP, Instagram on BidP. That is capital B, little I, capital D, space P. You can also find us on the Twitters. Hello, the Twitters. And if you want to contact me directly, you can always reach us at backinthedeck at gmail.com. So send us all your questions and all that stuff that you don't want the entire world to hear. And if you have one of those questions that you need Wizards Council on, let me know. I read the emails and I'm going, you know, I think I want to help this person with their math homework. Or I don't want to help this person with their math homework and shut up and study. And how can the people get, get a hold of you, Mr. Henchman? Uh, license to hench at uh, hotmail.com. Uh, awesome, blossom. Yeah, anything else? No, okay. That's pretty much it. Right All now. right, now a lot of uh, people... I do have a Facebook page, uh, License to Hench. So if you want to see the crazy, stupid, or weird things I'm working on, <laughs> they're, they're listed there as well. Uh, mostly it's me just talking about CNC machines. So. Oh, yeah, that's right. Now, for all of you guys, new viewers out there that have not met the Back in the Deck henchman, um, well, how can I put this? We call him the henchman because he asked us to, and that's like the respectful thing to do. But even beyond that, this is the man. Yeah, go ahead, wave at the people. This is the man that's responsible for a lot of the stuff that we manufacture. I, I look at him, and I'm like, you know, I'm feeling very Steve Jobs today. This thing only wants one button. So he is the, the essentially, he is the Wozniak of Back in the Deck Productions. So just a shout out to everybody that has actually like seen some of the stuff that we build and stuff. This man is is, I, like I said, he's the Igor to my wizard to my Doctor Frankenstein, which means it's he doesn't give me what I, I want. <laughs> it's pronounced Igor. Okay, he's the Igor, but either way, he doesn't I ever give me I what I ghoul. want. I ghoul. Oh, sorry. I go. I go. Bad. Bad British accent. I only, sorry, folks. I only have two two accents. They're both bad. <laughs> Yeah, so again, if you guys got questions about CNC machines or milling or, you know, the stuff that we do with silicon molding and stuff, when you go, oh my god, where did you get that prop from and how can I order it on Amazon? I'm going to say you can't order it on Amazon, but give it a little time and you'll be able to order them from us directly in time. After all, we're kind of doing this for a living, but it don't pay a whole lot. So, how was your weekend, man? <laughs> Pretty good, pretty good. Got to see the uh, new Justice League. We went mm. out and saw that. That was uh, that was fun. Uh, played the Games of Thrones uh, board game for the first time. Awesome. That was also uh, pretty good. I'm not really a board game guy, so if I got excited and into it, that that says a lot. <laughs> awesome, blossom. So I know. Um, yeah, I did a little bit of the board gaming too. Went to the movies, but um, it's funny because I talked. Well, I didn't talk. I looked at. A bunch of stuff that was happening on the lines and sure as shit we've got something new coming in um this is from vanityfair.com where um jason statham actually i think it's from vanity fair hollywood reporter it's it's vanity fair i think and um jason statham has been talking about 
how he's pulling for stuntmen to actually get Oscars. Yeah, and when I first saw this, my reaction was, what the hell? Like, they don't. Yeah, seriously. Like, I, I genuinely thought they did because <laughs> they have, the, you know, they have the Oscars where they walk the red carpet and everyone has the parties. And then the other day they have the technical Oscars, you know, for best sound, best cameraman. And I just assumed that stunts were on the list. I mean, we don't see it cause it's never really televised, but I mean, come on, stunt guys are what make action films and they aren't getting like actual Academy awards. Yeah. Well, and, that's actually Jason, Jason Statham's I mean, point. I mean, I mean, isn't there something for stunt direction at least? Um, I think it's rolled into special effects. Ugh. Yeah, I know. I know. But, um, yeah, they, they need to expand that category. Like, yeah, See, I'm kind of there. Um, I read something a few weeks ago from, um, what is our, uh, Danny Trejo and Danny Trejo was talking about how, um, stuntmen have a really important job in the fact that they're the ones who put themselves on the line. And when actors do their own stunts, um, if the actor gets injured, that's two or three weeks to a month and a half of 15 to 20 people out of work. Or if the stuntman gets hurt, you just swap them out for another stuntman. So yeah. he kind of wants um, he kind of wants the actors to stop doing their own stunts and stop actually taking jobs from people. Yeah. So um, And the, uh, the other thing is, too, in the era of you know, CG becoming much more believable and much more common. Um, you know, live stunts are even more important for catching the look and feel of what you're trying to do. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's flashy and it's new, but the eye can tell a lot of times as to whether that is a CG guy like being blown out of the back of a helicopter or a guy who's actually jumping. Yeah, well, and, and quite often it was... um. The thing that turned me on to this really were some of the behind the scenes stuff from Batman Begins all the way back in 2005. Dear God, it's been a long time. And um, they did this thing where they talked about the stunts and the stuntman and stuff. And I'm like, holy shit, Christian Bale's not Batman. This guy's Batman. This is the dude that's being like dragged through Chicago on freaking a rope that's being towed by a damn helicopter. And to this day, I can't remember his name. So we got to get some shout outs to the people who actually do the work. And of course, after all these years, it would be kind of nice to at least see Jackie Chan get an Oscar for everything that he does. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, because guys like Jackie Chan, they're different. They're 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 from, oh, the actor got hurt doing his own stunts. Well, suck it up, fun boy. We still got five more scenes to shoot. So. So, yeah, it's a different thing, man. The film industry is funny, 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 funny. Um, like I said, I was genuinely surprised that it wasn't already a category. Yeah. Like, yeah. So before we get into our main topic today, and this is, this is a real big thing. Um, our main topic of the day is going to be, of course, the stuff that comes down on the weekend and don't worry people. We're going to be talking about good old Frank Castle next week, but for this week, we want to talk about the elephant in the room, but we're going to tackle it from a few other, um, from a few other angles. Um, according to the Hollywood Reporter um, and the Weekend Box Office, the Justice League did not do as well as expected domestically. I think it pulled in what ninety four, ninety five million dollars. I'm asking. No. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking here. Yeah. Uh, uh, North America, it, uh, yeah, one hundred and eighty five million overseas for the global launch. Yeah, but for and... domestic, it it didn't even cover its budget. Um, yeah, it's funny. It's, it's funny. The article leads. It doesn't actually say the number. I would need a calculator. It gives you the total total global <laughs> of 281 and uh, 185 of that was overseas. So, yeah. So it looks like they pulled in a little under uh, 100 million. Now, what a world we live in when you're like, oh, we we didn't break 100 million. This is disappointing. You know, any other movie would be like, woohoo. Like one of the things that they're upset about, it, it's like, oh well, uh, Wonder sucked 127 million box office away from them that opening weekend. Uh, sorry, not 100, uh, 27 million box office. I'm like, well, Wonder know. made 27 million on opening day. I mean, hello, that's well, huge. And not to mention, it's kind of a movie with a better script, but we'll get to that a little later. Um, of course, I, mean, I guess they're time. looking at it. You know, we we spent 300 million to make this thing, so. We need a guaranteed return of such a percentage. And well, honestly, yeah, the new model is um, if you don't make 300 times your budget, 
so three times or three times your budget sorry 300 percent of your budget you're pretty much failing and they expect that on opening and all that stuff and i'm going all right you know what I wish my st- I wish I had stocks that performed at a guaranteed three hundred percent return. You know, honestly, I just wish I had ninety four million dollars. <laughs> but you know, we're a small operation in what I like to call my life, um, and <laughs> it's it's kind of interesting because I don't know this whole DC Marvel one. I don't like the rivalry myself because I'm forty. All right, I'm 40 fucking years old. So you know what that means? That means I was in the theaters in the last superhero renaissance. Yeah. And we've come a long fucking way since Steel. I'm sorry, but um, you know, we're looking at this and we're going, man, Justice League was, or, or Batman versus Superman sucked. And don't get me wrong, it was a bad movie, but it was no Catwoman. <laughs> it was like when people complain she about makes CGI. makes me feel kind of funny. Uh, no, Halle Berry makes you feel kind of funny, but yeah. Catwoman, um, it makes me feel funny in the sense of I can laugh again. <laughs> it, it, it's the best cure for depression I ever had because that that movie was a solid pair. But um, I mean, seriously, it was like a pair of sevens because I'm going, I, I can't stand this movie. So I guess I'm a little lenient on comic book movies today because I remember what we had. True, and you honestly, know? I mean. Now, since you brought it up, specifically Avengers, because Avengers was this such a phenomenal financial success. Oh, man. That, like, completely changed the old school paradigm of uh, superhero movies can't make money, which was an attitude that lingered because, you know, Superman 3 was a flop. And it wasn't because the script was terrible or they hired the wrong actors. It was because no one wants to see superhero movies. And um, Avengers, like, no, greatest, greatest box office of all time. Yeah. And, and you know, it, and, and it got everyone excited and everyone galvanized and really mainstreamed the comic book genre to everyone. Well, I think and, Iron Man had a lot more you know, to yeah, do with yeah. that. Well, I yeah, mean, well, yeah, it was it was it got there because of the earlier movies. Yeah, but exactly. that was the one that was just like blew up, blew everything else it away. Pretty much said, and hey. It, this is a thing now. And that didn't happen by accident because Ooh. Marvel had a plan and they executed it very well. But um, it also kind of raised the bar and has said that superhero movies are real movies. It's a so thing. So we can't just kind of phone it in and like give passing – uh, passing wave to the source material and say, yeah, yeah, okay, it's a woman, she's a cat, um, there's going to be some cat stuff, she wears leather, whatever, we'll go from there. <laughs> it's like, have you actually read the comics? Have you hired someone like to, who understands it to write it? Or is it just going to be, in the third act, fight a giant spider? Well, you know, we'll get to that third act thing, because I got some stuff to say about that, but that's when we do the Justice League review. Um, but just overall, the state of comic book movies... I'm going to say this, and man, I can feel the hate mail coming. I can already feel it. But what I'm seeing, especially with the DC properties. hmm? Give in to your hate. Mail us. (laughs) I'm just saying, if you don't like what we have to say, then you have to subscribe so that you can hear everything and yell at us directly. So um, what I got to say about that is uh, what I have to say about the whole Warner Brothers thing is. The expectation of the audience for every for Warner Brothers to well, how can I put it? We all know that Marvel got it right. That's the elephant in the room. Marvel yeah. got it right. Disney did it right. And yes, they set a new standard. But what's Warner Brothers going to do? Because if they do stuff close to Marvel, people are going to say they're copying. And if they don't do Marvel's things, people are going to say it sucks. So you know, they they got lightning in a bottle with Wonder Woman. But that came after the groundwork for the Snyderverse. You know, not the DCEU, but the Snyderverse was set. And um, with Man of Steel and BVS and now the Justice League, uh, excuse me, those those are all Zack Snyder projects from the bottom to the top from ground zero. And one of the things that they have to get over, really, is this is what Snyder intended, 
but this is what we're learning the the audience wants but it just seems like the audience as a whole keeps going too little too late give me deadpool shut up <laughs> you know so i'm serious that's what it seems like so i'm like have a little compassion because corporations have never been very wise <laughs> You know, they're not very smart entities. I'm not going to say they're people. Corporations are not people, but they are made up of people. And it's possible that an entire group of people get something wrong. You know, he says close to Thanksgiving with the whole pilgrims after Columbus and people thinking that the world was flat. Um, so I don't know. I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this rivalry thing? Well, I think you're right in that no matter what they do, people aren't going to be unhappy. They're they're not going to win this one simply because they entered the game late. Yeah. yeah. And they entered the game at a lurch. They, <laughs> you you know, I mean, Marvel Marvel had a plan. Marvel has been moving forward with it. They have a style. They they they're really they 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 they've got like the next. They had the the whole. Star or story arc and the comics and everything working together where DC was just kind of flailing around at first and True. they seem to be figuring it out more just by seeing what Marvel's doing and even if they go in their own direction they at least have seen that having a cohesive plan and here's a crazy thought paying attention to continuity between your cinema universe and your print universe helps well you know Marvel has Kevin Feige Okay, and Kevin Feige is one of the editors at Marvel Comics, mm -hmm. and he was right next to um right next to Favreau, Pr essentially from day one. Um, Kevin Feige was there, going, "Okay, this is important to the to the character as far as what the comics have established over mm -hmm. the past fifty years." DC just got someone. I'm not sure. I think it's Jeff Johns. Um, yeah, because Brian Michael Bendis just went over to DC, so. They just got Jeff Johns to do that. And Jeff Johns is known for things like um, Green Lantern, Blackest, Blackest Day, Brightest, or Blackest Night, Brightest Day story arc, um, the Justice Society of America, the late 90s, um, cleaning up the Hawkman continuity. So he's the, he is the Kevin Feige of DC Comics, as far as most people knows. But he's just now getting there. Yeah. He got there with Wonder Woman and Patty Jenkins. And, and, and look what happened. Yeah, well, Patty Jenkins wasn't stuck to Zack Snyder's vision for each film. She had her own vision for the film, but it had to fit in the Snyderverse, thus the ending. But um, Justice League started as a Zack Snyder project, and everyone's going, oh my god, Joss Whedon's here, Joss Whedon's here, now it's going to be cleaned up. Except for Snyder filmed everything before Whedon showed up. Whedon filmed a few more scenes, but the bulk of the movie had already been done and decided, and I mean, he showed up in post-production. That's where we're doing the ADR and the editing and color yeah. correction and all that stuff. So what Warner Brothers is doing now is moving a little bit away from the Snyderverse and going a lot closer to what makes our heroes our heroes. You know, and I think, um, again... I see the growing pains, and I see the um, I see the learning curve. And granted, Marvel did do the learning curve for pretty much every other superhero universe. But if Warner specifically does it, then they're going to get called out on it by most of the fans. My question is, what do the fans want other than good? That's the number one description I've gotten. Good or the cartoon. And it's like, if you want the cartoon, they're on DVD. Go get them. Yeah. You know, um, are we, are, huh? can we swear on this? Oh, totally. We okay. can totally swear on this. All right. Um, Bleeps are fun. I think uh, the, uh, the, the best review, the best fan review, as far as what fan wants, uh, I heard, I was given, I heard immediately after the very first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. There was a lot of anticipation. We went and saw Pirates of the Caribbean. We saw the movie. We loved the movie. And one of my diehard Disney fans, you know, turned to me and said. Wait, you know a diehard Disney fan? Yes. I didn't know there were any of those left. Yeah. And she turned to me and she said, they didn't fuck it up. And that was the best. That was the highest honor that could be given <laughs> to them. Because it doesn't matter what the product is 
it has to be filtered through our fan, our version of the fandom and our nostalgia. And it is very, very hard to beat those, especially if it's something that hasn't been in the public eye for, I got to keep not talking with my hands. No, the stuff, you can just stick that. Um, the, uh, we have stuff, editors. Yeah, the stuff that's, <laughs> Things that have been in the public eye for a long time, they start being colored by nostalgia. So, and it, you have to overcome that nostalgia because how many movies, how many TV shows have we seen? And we go, oh, they got it wrong. I remember when someone was screaming about how they made the, the Dukes of Hazard movie too hokey. And I'm like, did you watch the Dukes of Hazard? <laughs> I mean, really. How dare they turn 21 Jump Street into a comedy? It's like, yeah, You're dude, raping my child. Exactly. Go back, watch the show, and then watch the movie and go, oh. I, my biggest challenge on that was go back, watch the A-Team, mm-hmm. and try and make it post 9-11 without it being a comedy. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, so the fans are always you're always going to get that pushback from the fans. I think I think the best that they could do is not to make the best movie, just to make a movie that at least Im- it does not ignore the source. Okay. There are there are so many movies that are yeah, okay. Slight like anything by Yui Bold. <laughs> anything by Yui Bold. We pay. We pay a million dollars for this intellectual property, and then we completely ignore it. You know, it's like... What? In the Name of the King was a fucking masterpiece, man. Frontline forest ninjas? How can... How can I can't even say that shit with a straight face. I yeah. really can't. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I know we're allowed to curse on this, but shame on you. Shame <laughs> for that other foulness coming out of your mouth. Shame. Shame. Sir, uh, Ding. Shame. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you're never going to make anyone su- you're never going to make everyone statically happy. But you have I mean, you have the action, you have a good plot, and here's the crazy thing about comic books. You have decades of plot to run off of. The freaking storyboards are already there. Just open up the comic books, stick them on the wall. There's your storyboard. Move on from there. And there's always this, "Oh, well, we've got to put our own vision on it." But, you know, what if what if what if Superman was a vigilante and he was angry and he punched people and he, he, he no. Then he's Have not you read Superman. the comic book? Yes. <laughs> There's a guy for there. There's like six other comic book guys in that intellectual property that is the dude you want. Don't use Superman. I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, and I think that um, with this with this latest movie, this latest incarnation that's come out, they're recognizing that. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot. Superman's supposed to be a good thing. And that brings us to our next our, our mm-hmm. next subject there, um, the Batmanification of comic book heroes. Now, again, I am one of the most intellectually geeky people ever, and I say that in the sense of I'm geeky and I love all of my nerd stuff, but I am willing to give stuff a solid thought and not say I love it just because of cult of personality. With that. My geek cred goes out the window. Not really a great big fan of Batman right now. Just right now. Um, Much like Tim Burton um, and Joss Whedon, I'm a little overexposed. I'm just, it's, it's like I was arguing this fact with my girlfriend when I made a recommendation about the Justice League I'd kinda like to see if Affleck leaves and they do another Justice League movie. Um. And that is, I'd like to see Batman in more of an administrative post and not as much in the field. And she's like, the League isn't the League without the Trinity. I love my Hobbit. (laughs) And um, sure enough, I'm like, why am I kind of done with Batman right now? I will tell you. Eight. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight live action films. Twelve animated films five animated series ever since 1989 we have not gone three years without a dedicated batman property and they keep but they keep making money i understand that they keep making money i i do i truly do but with the breadth of good comic book characters that there are out there just focusing on one for dear god 28 
years. Okay, we get it. Batman is awesome. From Burton's 1989 mm-hmm. Batman to Thanksgiving Week 2017. From 1989 to 2017, which means there are people that was born in 1989 when Tim Burton's Batman in theaters that have always had Batman and has never, ever, ever in their life had someone like Captain Adam. Actually, no, I can't say never in their life because he had three episodes on the Justice League cartoon that always featured Batman being awesome. You know, and yeah, there's been like eight Superman properties, but really there's been two. Yeah. Technically three because the cartoon was actually pretty good. But outside of the comic realms, everybody knows Batman. He's a household name. We get it. Let's move on to another hero. And I think we're in a unique situation here because uh, Avengers proved that a team up movie was valid. Not only valid, but like exceptional and that changes the paradigm of hollywood they will now be making team-up movies for the next 25 years just ask universal (laughs) and and wonder woman which was a movie that was considered unmakeable for the last you know what 40 years yeah uh they took a risk they made it they made it good and oh my god it turns out if you let someone talented work you know, the problem is um, I had a really eye-opening experience watching the commentary track on disturbed behavior. Okay. Which, if you have a chance, if you have access to it, watch the commentary track on it. Because the interesting thing about disturbed behavior is every single scene in the trailer is not in the movie. Hmm. And you watch the deleted scenes. And usually when you watch the deleted scenes, you're like, wow, that, that scene needed to be deleted because it was bad. Or I can understand why they cut this for content. In Disturbing Behavior, the entire plot of the movie is cut. They cut something like 20 minutes out, and it's all the good scenes. Ah, Yeah, I, I actually yeah. remember that. And the director is not – what the director is – what's interesting is what the director doesn't say. He'll just say, yeah, I really love this scene, but we had to cut it because the studio wanted it cut. <laughs> and reading between the lines, what I got out of that was the studio came, saw his film, and went, we don't understand what it is you're making, but – and we're not going to take a risk because we don't know if this is going to make the return that we we are we have we have budgeted for. But we know how much money Scream had made, so we want you to turn this into a Scream style teenage slasher film, and change it so it's available to have sequels. Yeah, yeah. I, so much so that I they shot that. the ending. They shot a completely different ending like a year later with other people, <laughs> so that it could be sequeled. Yeah, and um. That was kind of the opening experience where you kind of have this kind of push and pull between the people making the movies who are trying to tell a story and the people making the movies as a, no, this is an investment and we have to have a guaranteed return. Yeah. And if we, if you're going, we, we have market analysis, we have revenue and it's all based on what's happened in the last five years. For example, superhero movies can never make, make money. Marvel suddenly comes out and says, we're going to go out and do this thing and bam. And now it's going to be nothing. Everything's going to be superhero. Everything. Everything. Um, and then you get these superhero movies that actually take risks and kick the doors off of the theaters. Like, I'm going to say this right now before we do the JLA um, review. This movie was not as good as Logan. I think my opinion and the opinion of most of Back in the Deck Studios is actually that Logan is is, in my opinion, the best comic book-based movie of 2017. And it was a risk. It was violent. It was dark. It was all of those things that people say they want Superman to be, along with the Batmanification, and we'll get back to that. Um, But it was something different. And last year, of course, we had the Deadpools, which was another risk. And that's a funny thing about Fox. Talk about a company that has their properties, but when they get them right, man, do they get them right. But there is no middle ground because you either have X-Men 2 and Deadpool or you have X-Men Origin Wolverine <laughs> and every Fantastic Four movie since Roger Corman. I mean, it's Yeah, I don't know why they can't. 
We'll, I, yeah. we'll talk about that at a, at a later time. We, we got some words about Fantastic Four. Believe me, we got some four words about Fox, but we really got some words. But back on topic, um, the Batmanification of the comic book things, it's, we like I said, I'm, I'm batman out. I'm dark batman out. I think my favorite Batman property was Batman Brave and the Bold. Um, well, no, let's face it. My favorite Batman property after Batman the Animated Series because, you know, know your roots. God damn it, know your roots. Yeah, that, that's um, what, that, that's, that's where I really fell in love with Batman yeah. was the, that, that, I'd never seen anything quite like that. Well, it was dramatic. It was a crime yeah. drama. It was the Batman that we'd come to know from the comic books. However, I do love me some Batman Brave and the Bold because it's, by the way, this stuff was originally marketed toward children and... I love you all. I'm one of those middle-aged nerds, but there comes a point where we have to understand that it's time that our kids got cool stuff too. So I want to share my love of things with my children instead of going, this is mine. You can't have my Batman. It's my Batman. And he's going to be dark and use guns and kill people and and brood and and, and all that stuff. And you can't have him because he's too mature for you. I'm like, no, I got Batman as a kid. I want to give Batman and Superman to my kids, call me crazy. Um, so listen, old chum. <laughs> we know the stuff that we had as children yeah. has been immortalized with digitization of mediums, but there's only so many episodes of the Adam West Show. There's only so many episodes of Star Trek: The Original Series. That thing had two seasons. Yeah, that's it. That that that's all. We got fifty episodes of of Kirk and the boys. So if I can give something to my kids that's theirs but reflects something that's mine, that's what I want to do. It's not about raping my childhood. It's about me growing up. And um, the fact that there, there's another movie critic that I, talk, that I listened to religiously, and he was saying we should not have to have meetings and meetings and articles about whether or not um, Superman – is too politically charged, edgy, and violent for children. <laughs> Are but you serious? That These are it conversa- was a thing for BVS. It really was. Um, because of the dark tone and the angry Superman and the amount of violence and the 9-11-ing of, um, of Metropolis. Yeesh. Those are all traumatic things with high levels of violence. And it's like, is this appropriate for children? And when it comes to superheroes with capes, that's not a question that you should ever, ever yeah. have to ask okay there's no question um as much as i adore the dark knight and i do i adore the dark knight um that is one of the only um royal flush movies that we only movie that we've actually given a royal flush to at this channel but i wouldn't take my five-year-old to see it you yeah. know, because my five year old does not need to see a dead body covered in paint being lynched outside of the wall, uh, outside of the window of a damn office building. Yeah, that's um, it might be PG-13, but what happened to PG? Yeah, you know, and most superhero movies like Avengers nailed it. That was a kid friendly yet adult savvy um, superhero movies. And that's where Marvel is doing it well. So with the Batmanification, I can't let kids watch Arrow. You know, I and Green Arrow was always supposed to be the light side of, of Batman. It's like Batman is dark and brooding. Yeah, he, and sh- Oliver he Queen shot is people butt. with giant boxing gloves. boxing gloves. Yeah, because sometimes you want to punch someone in the face, but you're too far away. <laughs> I mean, that is literally the explanation. And, and the sleep arrow, and you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's silly and it's goofy, but it's got those morals, and they have that whole. Well, you see, Timmy. Being good to people is what really makes me a hero. Not you failed this city, brooding I, darkness. I even, I even, yeah. again, I was raised on the the cartoons primarily. So I remember in the the one of the one of the Justice League cartoon series where there was that whole Arrow Arrow like gets fed up with the Justice League and he's like, "You're you're we're growing too big. We're dealing with international crisis. We're dealing with global crisis." But the little guy is being forgotten and you've pulled all the heroes off the street. You put them in the sky, but no one's helping the little guy. And he leaves yeah, who's to, the go, that stops bank to go roof, rooftop jumping again, because that's who he was. Yeah. 
you know, it, it, stopping purse catchers and bank robbers. Exactly. Because... And unlike Superman, not doing a million dollars in collateral damage every time <laughs> he did so. Well, yeah, and that's that's the whole thing. There was a point where Superman didn't do that. You know, Christopher Reeves, let's face it, his Superman did not trash a city. Matter of fact, an important plot point in Superman 2 was him putting the building back together in the middle of the fight between Zod and, um, and Urza. I mean, yeah. and he's like, ah, oh, I finally have his weakness. He cares. He cares for these people. Oh, like pets. You know, and he was putting a building back together that they that they um, broke while they were fighting. And he's like, wait, no. Matter of fact, from Superman 2 on, Superman's catchphrase. At first it was, you know, you diseased maniac when talking to Lex. But afterwards it's, no, don't do it. The people. Yeah. And, um, you know, and you totally get it. Watch Superman 2 and Superman 4. Quest for Peace was garbage, but at least Christopher Reeves still showed I care about collateral damage. You know, he's always bugged me about that from Superman 2. Hmm. It's like, oh, these people, they're worms. Oh, they're like pets. Oh, yes, they don't have superpowers like you didn't four hours ago. <laughs> And suddenly you have superpowers, and look, again, and they instantly like revile like non empowered people as the scum uh, under their boot. And it's like, no. Well, I kind of looked at it like they reviled everyone as the scum underneath their boot anyway. Yeah. But because um, Earth is not as technologically advanced as Krypton was and all that. So, quite honestly, um, the superpowers just augmented their already huge egos. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to this Batmanification, like heroes have got to be this dark and brooding thing all the time. And I'm like, one, grim dark. I mean, we talked about this grim dark. Yeah. Yeah. Lot, lot, lots and lots of grim dark. And I'm like, you know, I, if grim dark was a thing that everybody had to be, why did the first and third Thor movies kick ass in the box office? Yeah. Why is Guardians of the Galaxy so freaking popular now when no one knew who the Guardians were five yep. years ago? You know, so it's like, oh, hell, when they said they were going to make it, people were like, it's got a talking stick and a raccoon. This is going to be terrible. And then everyone was like, oh, my God. Yeah, and every time it's on TV now, everybody's like, oh, my God, it's the Guardian. And now I look at the Groot being cute and dancing to the Jack and Five. And, then, and it's got some dark themes. But it's light and airy. And I'm not saying that everything needs to be a damn comedy. Okay? Mm -hmm. Not everything has to be a comedy. But not everything has to be... Um, well, let's face it. Let's look at Superman. He can beat Batman in almost everything, including amount of dead parents. <laughs> Superman has three <laughs> dead parents. Yeah, you know, I always... <laughs> I, I was never happy with the choice to kill off... Uh, Jonathan? Jonathan. That, I, that... I loved it. I, well, I loved it in 1978. Yeah. <laughs> I did not love it in 2016. <laughs> Again, because because in a world where so many people do not have the idyllic American family, you know, the supportive parents, the the uh, the dad who is emo physically and emotionally available, having at least one superhero who has a family, who has parents, who you know, can go home to Thanksgiving to have the Norman Rockwell Christmas on a literal farm. <laughs> you know, he has that, that space and that ties into the whole like beacon of hope. And then you have, you know, Batman and he's the orphan. He's the tortured soul. He's, he's eating he, lobster Thermidor by he, himself. By on himself. The bat boat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, Thanksgiving dinner is him in an empty room because he may have money, but he has no joy. You know, he's, I always thought that Superman and Batman were an excellent study in contrast. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. Batman is a figure who skulks in the shadows. Superman is literally in high contrast, red and blue. You can see him for miles floating above the city. <laughs> he stops to shake hands with police officers. He poses for photographs. Whereas he rescues Bat cats from, from trees. trees. And then when little and girls talk about it, they get slapped by their moms. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, he, he stops to give well thought out advice and uh, <laughs> and a you know emotional uplifting commentary whereas batman the second you take your eyes off him he's, he's gone. gone yeah he's out At, was he ever here i don't know why does he do that and um it just 
and like in the old cartoons, I always thought it was very interesting that, you know, they had the Batman cartoon and everything is just dark, you know, because they were doing mm-hmm. that, that dark paper. And Gotham was the city of darkness. Well, you Gotham were, was what people are afraid Detroit's going to turn into. And, and, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Metropolis, Metropolis was, everything was white. And city it was tomorrow. always the city of day. It was the city of tomorrow. It was mm-hmm. all very modern and it was always well lit. Mm-hmm. And uh, they usually, when you saw an exterior, it was always white buildings in the day. Whereas white Gotham, people. it's white people. <laughs> whereas Gotham was shadow and alleys and you poor know, white people. You could, you know, <laughs> exactly. But uh, the uh, so when you get into this Batman vacation, where everyone starts to be grim and dark and and brooding and everything, that you lose that contrast and you lose. You know, and we were also talking about the. Are we going to transition a little into the JLA movie yet? Oh, well, or, thank you yeah. for letting the audience know where we're going with this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so just skip to that time frame, okay? If you guys just want to know what we feel. Okay. But uh, so, yeah, and then there's like there's so many different other properties. But again, there. I don't think the studio. I don't think a studio is willing to make a, you know. Hundred and fifty million dollar investment on Blue Beetle because they don't know what Blue Beetle is. They don't know who he's tested. They're going to say, "Hey, well, how many? Blue, what was the last Blue Beetle, Beetle, Blue Beetle movie do in box?" And you're like, "Well, there's never been there's, one." And well, they're going like, "Well, let's just make a Batman one. We've got eight hundred Batman scripts well, that we own." You want the good news? They are working on Booster Gold. That's been in talks for a long time, and oh my. God, am I waiting for that fresh air? Well, I've already seen the trailer for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Ready Player One. Well, we're yeah. we're seeing the we're seeing the opening trailer of Ready Player One, and and, and he leans over in the theater and he's like, "Do you know what this is?" And I watch it. You know, dystopian future. There's nowhere to go. I love the '80s. Super high tech in a junkyard. And I'm like, "Is that is that Booster Gold?" And he's like, "No, but I can see where you got that from," yeah. because. Except- um, Booster Gold's future isn't dystopian. It's the DC future. So everywhere is Metropolis. Yeah, but I thought they were, you know, yeah, going in a different direction. Making it a little more grim. Make a grim. Bad, bad, the entire world is Batman. Yeah, and In a world where everyone is Batman. Yeah, and for those of you guys that know who Booster Gold is, you know, comment, wave, and comment on everything that we're talking about. And for those of you guys that don't, rent Mystery Men because Kevin or Greg Kinnear. Greg Kinnear's character of what what was his um, uh, pretty much Captain Amazo in Mystery Men is Booster Gold top to bottom just super powered fuck up that's totally going for he like takes the glasses off <laughs> when he transforms and he doesn't like, yeah and he's like yes every time I finish it every time I I bag a bad guy I'm going to have this endorsed drink now pay me my money and um and he's fun and he's light and it's great and so that's that's where, you know, there's been talk about a booster goal thing and negotiations for years. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Taking that risk for booster gold and blue beetle would be like, hey, look, it's a buddy comedy. It's essentially a. Um, the, but the problem, the problem is booster gold isn't a risk for them. Hmm? Booster gold is their Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Well, now and they look. Well, what, you go. You go and you pitch it. and You go. What? What kind of uh, movie is this? You go, well, it's kind of like Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, okay. Well, we know what that did. Well, it's uh, it's more like they have to pitch it. Like it's a James Franco uh, movie, huh? Frank mm-hmm. Franco and Seth Rogen. Franco and Rogen. Hey, it's Franco and Rogen, without capes, but in spandex, huh? Franco and Rogen, huh? And um, and hopefully that's where they're going, and it looks like it. Um, and speaking about what it looks like as far as the transition goes, let, let, let's talk about this. Because I left on Instagram that we were going in to see it, and I was afraid it was going to be a garbage fire. And oh my it was not. God. Oh my God. The amount of people that, that hit me up saying, I know it's going to be a garbage fire. I can't wait for your review. I want you to tear the shit out of this movie and all that stuff. And you know what? I got some shit to say. I, I, I got something to say. Look, look. All right, let, let me tell you something. Let me let me, let me tell you something. Okay, yeah, let me speak it. Speak the word. All right, JLA, number one. I'm gonna do my best for this not to be a uh, for this to be a spoiler free review. Okay, Ew. here's the downside. Y'all have already seen the first hour of this movie. Okay, if you watch 
all three trailer sequences that you can find from YouTube. You've seen the first hour. All right, it the first hour is this is Batman, this is Wonder Woman. Now Batman's going to go and try and gather up people and these are the conversations that he has and this is him trying to build the Justice League for a reason. Now, what they don't show in the trailers? Oh wait, they did. Was the bad guy finally coming to Earth? We know there's going to be an Amazon fight. We know we're going to see um a little bit of Atlantis and then the second half of the movie starts. So how can I not spoil this movie when you've already seen the first hour? And I think that's a fuck up on Warner Brothers part because they're so afraid on bad, of bad did, press. Did they did they show who the villain was in any of the trailers? Yes, they did. Matter of fact, uh, they showed the scene where he teleports in to the mascara. That was a bad call on their <laughs> part. Yeah, I kind of I kind of stayed away from the trailers. I kind of stayed away from from that and. Um, I kind of went in with a, with with no expectations mm. except about the Amazon costumes because that was all over my Facebook oh, that feed. Fucking thing. And uh we'll, we'll, we'll so get we'll, to we'll that get to that. Week. But oh. um the uh yeah, why, why are we doing spoiler free? I mean huh? um just in well, case hi, we will be reviewing this, you know. I realize this is coming out the Wednesday after JLA has actually hit theaters, okay? I know this. Yeah. But there's always Look, this is the 21st century, and millennials Every, are like, "Don't spoil it." It's like, "Yeah, did you see that this, news report yesterday?" Yeah. Oh no, don't spoil it. You know, it's, yeah. You know, today I think the sun's coming out tomorrow. Don't spoil it. You know, yeah. so I mean, yeah. again, this is a realm where people watch the HBO show of Game of Thrones, but the books have been out for 22 fucking years, and they don't still spoil have, it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Do, do you know what's going to happen at the wedding? It's going to be happy, right? Oh, you no spoiler, summer child. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. <laughs> I got to put out that I'm going to try and make it a no spoiler review, but Eesh. it's hard not to spoil the first hour because it literally is this trailer, this part of the trailer, hard cut to this part of the trailer, hard cut to this part of the trailer, yeah. hard cut to this trailer, hard cut to this trailer, hard cut to this trailer. Well, um, I don't know if I can do spoiler free just because. Well, with that being said, it's not bad because what has made the DCEU not work and they tried playing with this with suicide squad a little bit but the thing that's made the dc extended universe not work is how can we go into deep philosophical or political commentary with these iconic characters like the biggest thing that people hated about bvs was Zack snyder's failed attempt to do deconstruction social analysis on superman in a post 9 11 world yeah and because, um, you know, in a post 9-11 world, if Superman showed up, people wouldn't trust him. They'd be like illegal aliens in Trump America. It'd be like build a wall between here and outer space. I mean, let, let's face uh, it. He's white. Oh, yeah, you're right. So yeah. when the Green Lantern shows up, it'll be like, you know, build a wall. <laughs> um, Wh- but, which one? Huh? Um, they're not doing hell. Nah. If they were going to if they were going to do Hal Jordan. They would have to get past Ryan Reynolds, and they can't because he's Deadpool, which means everybody remembers him. Yeah. So here's a hope. Here's a shout out to somebody I went to school with. Let's hope that they call in Tyrese. Or honestly, I think Michael B. Jordan would be way great for John Stewart, the Green Lantern, because mm. they showed Green Lanterns in the flashbacks. Yes. In this movie, and it Green Lanterns it are okay. Yeah, it looked okay. And, and yeah, actually, I didn't think about that, that that they were actually opening the door for a uh, a new Green Lantern movie just based on the events of the film. A lantern should be dispatched to Earth. Shit is happening. Yeah. <laughs> Things that, you know, make the big red light light up <laughs> on the uh, board. And, yeah, send, yeah. send Ooh, someone there to go look at that. We need a lantern at uh, uh, Sector 2814, please. Yeah, one lantern. Don't worry, you guys are going to get five in time, but don't worry about that. Yeah. Um... But with that said, this movie didn't do that. It didn't say, well, what would happen if a team of superheroes got together in a world where no one trusts each other? In Trump America, there will be a vigilante force of nope, nope, nope. They're like, we're superheroes. Let's get together. There's something coming. And honestly, they tried it with Suicide Squad, but it was dumb. Primarily because they're trying to put together a fighting force in case Superman went bad and they called the dude, they called a dude with a gun and a dude that threw boomerangs and a dude with a skin condition. Yeah, they're going to take down Superman. Um, so, 
Yeah, you know? not um, that. If you're gonna, if you want to take down Superman, you need something a little more powerful. Yeah, like Lois Lane's reproduction, reproductive organs. But we'll get to that a little later. Um, so yeah, so sorry, spoilers. You've already seen the first hour of the movie, but that does not take away from that quality because everything that people have been compl- okay so uh as i was saying so you know uh i think wonder woman they'll i think it would just be splitting hairs over how the wonder woman's role in the film but i think they would it, they had done such a good job with her in her own movie they could not do a bad job with her in in uh jla just because of what had already been established exactly it's the one worst of thing that would happen is up. is they'd be like i wish she had more screen time i wish she had better better lines i but i figured that the actual character was good the one that i was really like i do not like was aquaman because i thought they were going to do basically he was going to be car dog dark car dog cal drogo cal drogo i can never say that name properly my henchman cal- is the only person on earth that hasn't seen all five seasons of game of thrones i don't have on. hbo <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just waiting, you know, <laughs> I figure I'll get around to it. Um, but, uh, I'll loan you the DVD set. Uh, uh, Cal, t- t- yeah, t- I figured I expected him to be Cal Drogo, you know, big, hairy, you know, things. And, um, it was not quite what I expected. And I think they did a very good job of making him, uh, just a very powerful character. You know, they made the talk to fish joke a lot, but it was done in a way that I think works because well, he's freaking ba- Aquaman. The first thing you see when Aquaman is the first time you see Aquaman. Oh, he's the guy who talks to fish. Right. And then his responses and the way he handles it. I'm like, no, actually, I think they did that very well. They, yeah. they well, talked about the elephant in the room and they got past it. Well, honestly, I think they kept off balancing it or they kept balancing it out with, OK, you talk to fish. Yeah, but you got no powers. Well, yeah, there's that. Yeah, but and I'm the, rich, bitch. Yeah, that's great, but you got no powers. I, I especially like the bit of you dress as a bat. I dig it. You dress as a bat. And he's funny. Meanwhile, I'm stripping naked and going to swim in the Arctic Ocean. So <laughs> yeah, you dress as a bat, dude. I'm dropping into water that will kill you in eight seconds, and and swim away at like you know 600 miles a wa- an hour. And I gotta say, that's one thing I have to give to Zack Snyder as a filmmaker. Okay, he's really big on show don't tell, primarily because he can't really direct actors. <laughs> but um, so he'll show, like, yeah, that scene with Aquaman, like jumping into the Arctic water. It's like, yeah, it's just, you know, it's just Cal Drogo or the dude from that surf show back in the '90s jumping into water. What? And it's like, no, 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 guys, guys, that water is deadly. Like, yeah. Batman can't follow him. And if you look really closely on the left side of the screen after that scene, you see him swimming off underneath the water at about 30 miles per hour yeah he shoots off you see that you see the cavitation wake left behind him and then later on there's word a, for the day ladies and gentlemen. cavitation cavitation that's when you move in the water so fast you create the water equivalent of the sonic boom it's really nice yeah um the uh he also is uh there's a scene where he's they show him swimming to battle and he is just going through the water at incredible speed. And mm-hmm. he's not swimming. He's flying. He's, flying. <laughs> he's, he's flying moving by hydrokinesis in that he is one with the ocean and controlling the ocean. And he's just boom. And it is a very powerful moment. And it shows him to be a, a, a force to be reckoned with. Absolutely. And uh, I, I actually do again, the spoil, fact. spoiler alert. So we might have to. Yeah, right no, 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 no. We'll, we'll get to spoilers at the yeah. end of the review. Um, so other things, because, you know, the plot is, again, really simple. Um, find people with superpowers. Um, bad guys come in. We got to beat up the bad guy and save the status quo. And y'all already know, because you've seen all the posters, Superman comes back. Okay, Superman comes back. We've seen it coming. We know it's a thing. He's back, and he's pissed. For about four minutes. But... Um, <laughs> And in that four minutes, they settle the 30-year-old argument. Screw your prep time. No one can beat Superman easily. I know, I know, but that book was satire. Get away from your keyboards. It was satire, all right? If it wasn't satire, there wouldn't have been all of those 
freaking panels in The Dark Knight Returns that were commentary on 80s Reaganomics and the privation of talk shows, all right? It, it was a, the book was a satire. And the whole, can Batman beat Superman? The answer is no. If Superman wanted to, Batman would, well, um, I believe it's Bet, not Bandit Incorporated, but um, Mr. Sunday Movies has a video that says 50 different ways that Superman can kill Batman, and all of them are quick, including left-hand karate chop and right-hand karate chop. <laughs> so this movie actually shows the first fight scene with Superman um, had two things about it. One, this is how powerful he is. And two, this is what happens when you forget that you actually have a plot and you get caught up in you get caught up in a moment because they're trying to in this scene keep the ball away from the bad guys, but then they get into the fight and the bad guy gets the ball. <laughs> and really it's like, you know, why are you guys fighting? And that's one of the things I appreciated was when I'm going, Okay, this is an awesome scene, but according to the plot, okay, good, they thought about that. And I can see that that was Whedon's influence on that, but um, but all in all, um, how can I put it? It's not as good as Wonder Woman. We didn't expect it to be as good as Wonder Woman because yeah. it's a patch job. And whenever you see a movie that starts with one director and ends with another director, it's not going to be all that great. Re X three. Let's really look at that because you got some you got a boss coming in and finishing up someone else's work that they started instead of starting over. So yeah. it's not going to be that great in that respect. But I thought it was better than Suicide Squad and I thought it was better than BVS and Man of Steel. Well, here's the question. Mhm. Here's the question you got to ask yourself. Looking at JLA, just Mhm. Did they fuck it up? Not entirely. Okay. But um Again, we'll we'll get to that. Now, for those of you guys, um, what well, what are your thoughts on this henchman as far as like non spoilers go? Just overall. Okay. Um, we'll save our ratings until after spoiler talk. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed it. I'm glad I saw it. Uh, I don't feel I. There were elements and things that I that I would that I didn't think were appropriate, but overall, I think they did a very good job. And the more we've talked about it, and the more they we've discussed it, I've saw I've discovered things in the film that I didn't catch. That I'm like, oh wait, I see what they did there, and I think that uh, it's good as a standalone, but more importantly, it's good as a transition piece mm -hmm. to bring them into whatever they're working towards in uh, future stuff. Okay. So I, I think that uh, it was really about getting the, the characters kind of like established in their new universe and working on, you know, future properties. All right. I'm, I'm with you on that one. Um, so now let, let's talk characters because, mm -hmm. you know, that's what everybody wants to know. Like, did they do this person right? Did they do that person right? We talked about Aquaman a little bit, so let's pick up there. Um, Aquaman, now, I have been one of the sole torchbearers of Aquaman in my immediate community because the dude is terrifying. Okay, he's terrifying. In the studio, ladies and gentlemen, off screen, I've actually got an Aquaman thing on the wall. And it shows him looking badass and sort of like Jason Moa, sort of like the Peter David run of Aquaman. Mm -hmm. And it, it's pretty awesome. But um, Momoa's character as Aquaman, I'm like, okay, I never looked at Aquaman as a bro. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, because he's very much, hey, bro, hey, bro. We're going to go use some fish to fight some monsters, bro. I'm going to jump in the air and, and stab this thing with my trident, bro. Hey, I'm going to surf the Batmobile, bro. How you, how you digging with that, bro? But you know what? I kind of liked him. Like he, I, I think it's because Jason Momoa is so charismatic as a bro. Like yeah. I've never seen him very – I've never seen him as a dramatic actor. I've never really seen him carrying a bunch of lines. I don't see him reciting Shakespeare. But – they did Batman him up a little bit. Well, he's always been a dark character yeah. is the thing. He's always had this man of two worlds kind of heavy as the head that wears the crown thing. And yeah, but, like but, in, but in this one, he was he, he was a man. Of, he was, if you'll excuse the pun, 
very much a fish out of water kind of thing. Cause he, oh. yes. Yeah. I had to no say excuse. it. People. No, boo. Okay. Boo. Don't worry. Ding. We'll fix that. In Shame. Po- we'll fix Ding. that in post. Oh no, that's going out. That's you. You're, you're <laughs> going to be known for that. All right? but, okay. Now I have to work that into every podcast <laughs> from now on. But sometimes the joke is so obvious. You must tell it. Yes. Not the bees, not the bees. <laughs> anyway, you were but, saying. uh, uh, because he is uh, not a creature of the land, not a creature of the ocean. They kind of address that a little bit. They also address the fact that, you know, he's he hates Atlantis because, you know, he's not full Atlantean. Well, and there's other the, stuff. Going my mom on. was never there. Why should I care? Yeah. You know? And they kind of address all of that. And they really do. Actually, I thought they did a very good job in a very short amount of time. Yeah, I think there was only minutes and 20 seconds. Yeah, like one or two, like one scene, a couple lines of dialogue really established his character's backstory without like narrating it. It was, ve- it was very good job. And like you it wasn't reading a very big exposition yeah. dump. Yeah. yeah. It was, you read between the lines, you got the vibe and you even got it to when he's like, Hey, I'll put all this behind me and go do what needs to be done. But he, but, he, he has some conditions. Yeah. And the conditions are actually reasonable. Um, then we've got, well, how can I put it? Um, where every, I'm just going to spoil what you oh, wait, think for I everybody. Just, yeah. I just picked up on another thing. I hadn't really picked up again. Again, hmm. uh, I, I really think that one thing I noticed, because we've talked about this, one thing I noticed is that they seem to go out of their way to have each one of the, all the characters seem to have an evolution within the film. Yes. They seem to evolve and, and become their better More selves. More than so, yeah. Better selves. And in some cases, it was kind of meta and subtle and in other cases is more obvious but actually now i think about it there was i i now see that moment in retrospect when uh aquaman transitions from you know angry bra on who, who's like walking away from from his family i'm gonna walk away from it, you batman because i gotta walk away yeah I, i'm a loner I, I yeah good luck with that i'm gonna do yeah, my own thing man, i care strong. about nothing yeah I care about nothing. Really? Well, why are you saving these people's lives? Shut up. <laughs> you know, and then, and then there's a moment where he trans he translates from that to the King of Atlantis. Okay. With that, I do have to say that being convinced by a hot redhead who went toe to toe with a God definitely helps. True. But I mean, I, 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 I yeah, <laughs> there's that. But um, uh, she's also family, and he's like, yeah, because whatever. Yeah, well, no, she's not family. She she worked yeah. for his mom. Uh, it was like, I, I worked for your mom, and great, she wasn't around. And it was like, yeah, and let me tell you what her <laughs> life was like, yeah. bitch. And it was, all right, but I got a condition, and it has to do with wardrobe. Give me an well, Atlantean wardrobe. He, <laughs> no, he liter- literally assumes the mantle of Atlantis. Mm-hmm. So in that moment... He accepts his heritage. He accepts, he embraces his role because he's literally told, your mom is the one who fought this asshole. And now that he's back, it's your job. And he's like, okay. All right, cool. Oh, but in the words of Todd from Bojack Horseman, yay, a purpose. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah and he, he accepts it. He embraces it and he owns it. And later on, he, he, he even knows what it, it means to do this because yeah. later on he talks about it. Yeah. And that, that was a big thing. Now to spoil the crowd for who you love, when there's trouble, you know what to do. Call cyborg. <laughs> he can shoot a rocket from his shoe. Cause he's cyborg. Finally, a superhero movie where the black guy wasn't the butt of the joke and he lived. Granted, he started off as a mangled abomination, but he got better. And that was actually kind of cool. I, honestly, in this movie, I think Cyborg, in this specific film, Cyborg is hands down my favorite character. He goes through a very clear evolution and uh, a very clear humanization. And interestingly enough, I think, it was we talked about it, Barry kind of assists with that, which is what Barry's role is. We'll, we'll get to that in and, time. Let's just talk but, about, let, let's just talk about Victor. Yeah. Cause when he first, I mean, we first see him in the earlier thing, he's, he, he, his character didn't really get a lot of 
development in the other no the other film no and he was just sort of there and kind of this thing it's like okay well maybe they'll bring him in later he was a youtube clip dude yeah. be honest <laughs> so um and then he shows up and he's got some great dialogue uh and um he's very angry and he has reason to be yeah that was that was one of the things i really appreciated yeah which was this dude's in a bad mood but then when you realize he's ha- he um cyborg like they actually did him pretty comic accurate to where his only organic bits are half of his pectoral muscles one arm his neck and his head yeah half his head so and yeah because you know bits of him are being replaced and he doesn't know if he's even him anymore and he's got a lot of anger issues and he's very grim dark but well he's it, it's that whole but son i did what i did to save your life and he's like next time don't yeah you, you, <laughs> just, just, you did the right things for the wrong reasons but you should not well you did the wrong thing for the right sorry, reasons, sorry yeah the wrong thing yeah. for the right reasons that's, that's well, what like, i meant well, to say thanks dad but didn't you fucking learn with skynet i mean seriously yeah yeah as soon as Solar <laughs> pointed out that his dad built skynet i was like laughing my ass off i'm like oh my god you're right <laughs> Did you think they got that actor specifically for that reason? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> someone in, someone knew what they were doing when they were casting, but yeah, you know, they, but we need the sci-fi black guy. Call this dude because you know it worked <laughs> for Eureka too. So yeah, <laughs> but, um, um, but so he's very angry. He's very you know he's got some serious issues, but they're completely justified. But here's the most important part: he works past them. Yeah, he works past them. He becomes. He smiles. He's happy. And yes, spoiler alert. Yes, you do get a booyah. <laughs> and you know what? It was at the right time and the right place for the right reasons. Thank you, Joss Whedon. And honestly, by, um, honestly, the more you see him on screen and the more he's starting to come out of his, his shell, the more I'm thinking, when is he going to booyah? Is he going to booyah? Are they going to give him a booyah? He needs a booyah. And, and then he gets, he gets the booyah. booyah. And you're like. And it was the right kind of booyah, yeah. which I kind of liked. Um, yeah, it it, it was wasn't a, my man, but, you know, yeah. which, let's face it, um, Rick and Morty ruined that line forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what what I really dug about him, I mean, on the comedic front, he had the coolest swagger out of everybody. He's just like, yeah. He'd take a step. Mm, 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 mm. I hacked the street lights. Mm, mm. Mm. So yeah, that 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 was cool. But honestly, and I also was amu- I also was amused at the gratuitous cyborg ass shot. <laughs> well, everybody got an ass yeah, shot except yeah. Batman. Batman yeah. got no gratuitous butt shot because they all know that we saw Batman and Robin. So, <laughs> so yeah, we can call that like a little bit of an homage. That was kind of cool. Um, and of course, um, there's a lot like talk about a divisive issue. I personally like Batfleck. I do. I, I mean, um, he, he works. I mean, every time they cast anyone as Batman, like, no, he can't be. He can't be Batman until he is Batman. Until he is Batman. Batman. Except <laughs> for Clooney and Kilmer. Um, <laughs> no, no, that was Bale. <laughs> that was Bale. <laughs> and again, I just think fans are going to find something wrong because they want someone who looks like Christian Bale and who acts like Kevin Conroy. Yeah. And I don't think that's going to happen because Kevin Conroy is, you know, 10 years older than we are. And he doesn't have eight movies in him um, for physical acting. But, um, but there is someone out there. I mean, okay, Ben Affleck to Batman is not Heath, Le- Heath Ledger to the Joker. But I think he's fine. I mean, yeah. you know, the rich, cocky dude that's a little tired of everything. And people, I think, are divided over the fact that Batman and Superman are not the same age. And that takes a little getting used to. Yeah. Because in the books, Batman is like a year and a half older. Yeah. And now he's now it's millennial Superman versus Generation X Batman. Yeah. And you can see that. um they wanted to kind of play with that dynamic, but they don't, and they should. They they really should. I, I think in this in this uh, movie, uh, Affleck really does carry across a, a very world weary, very tired <laughs> yeah. Bruce Wayne, um, and that's because we see him mostly as Bruce. We don't really see him that much as Batman. And the other thing I found very interesting, and I actually liked it is there's one scene where you see him as Batman sporting like a three-day 
Oh yeah, beard. sport sport in the flat so he's got, shadow. He's got, he's got the stubble thing going on there, <laughs> and I thought, you know, to to illustrate Batman is tired or pushed beyond his limit. I thought that was a very good way to show that in a very a very short period of time. See, I personally like the scene that we'll talk about more when we get to the spoiler section, but it was be- one of the scenes between he and Wonder Woman, which mm-hmm. now that I've said it, you know exactly the one I'm talking about. Um, and now let's get to, in my opinion, the biggest disappointment, which was Ezra <laughs> Miller as the Flash. Because uh, I get yeah. comic relief, but as a Lifetime Comics fan... If you're going to do Barry, do Barry. And I think the show does it well, but this is the movie, so how do you do it, not the show? But they have Barry with Wally's attitude, and there's... Yeah, they kind of confuse the characters a little bit, I think. Yeah, and and I think um, um, I I said it, like my mentors said it, and I couldn't unsee it, so I'm going to say it for them. It does seem like Barry Allen is on the spectrum. No, yeah, no, that is actually... Barry likes trains. That... that, (laughs) There is a specific scene that they they really do kind of establish that that he has and and they continue that kind of vibe. I mean, it's not it's not heavy handed and over your head, but it is it is definitely there. You mean the brunch conversation? Yeah, the brunch conversation. Yeah, the brunch conversation. And uh, they don't go to brunch; they talk about brunch. And, and yeah. his his commenting that he has difficulty interacting with people on a social level. Yeah. And um, it's also kind of illustrated when you see his little geek cave <laughs> where he 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 uh, his little flat that he's renting because he can't earn a living which yeah. again I'm also was kind of like I guess they just wanted I think they kind of want to have that Spider-Man thank you for giving me money moment. I guess. So they had to have a character who was impoverished because you know, the well, guy is before this is before he becomes a cop and everything. But um, but I mean, it, it was a difference. It's a difference before making him like a struggling college student and making him you're working six jobs and you're living in a dumpster. Yeah. You know, and again, that's it might have been millennial commentary on the current state of economic aff- affairs. But I, it wasn't actually, really I think maybe, I actually I think that's probably where they were going with that. Is yeah. they were, he was, he's clearly the youngest character so they're trying to tap into that kind of gestalt and eh, i mean the problem with the problem with bringing any social commentary into a film is you instantly date the film yeah so when you come back and you watch it 10 15 years later you're going to be like well it could also be an homage to the two hours of your life you'll never get back which was the 1996 justice league tv pilot um, I don't think I saw that. Good, because there, there, you don't have that kind oh, of wait. time living. Yeah, I and did. either that or I did saw it, see it, and I had it, you know, chemically erased. Yeah, I, I, it definitely throws you into a fugue state. And um, but that flash specifically was a bro who couldn't get his crap together. He had like four jobs: one as a postman, one as like a, deli- a pizza delivery guy, and he liked <laughs> playing with kids. And it was nothing like Barry Allen ever. And they had like Guy Gardner in the show, as, but he looked like Kyle Rayner. But I mean, it was it was bad. It was it was it was more '90s than '90s, but it was '90s TV budget. So yeah, I mean yeah. It, it, it it was bad, and I, mean, I think it was like, oh look, Barry is a screw up with all these different jobs. So let's let's just pay a little homage there. And um, the the other thing that the other thing that bothers me, I mean, if you think about it for more than four seconds, uh, he's a speedster. Mm. So why would he be struggling? Because you know what he does? He takes six delivery jobs at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you're working six jobs. Well, yeah, I am. I'm only working 14 hours a week, but I'm working six jobs. Yeah, and um, let's face it. If I had super speed, I would be the best courier ever. Yeah. I I would be the second best mover ever, or third best, because first best would be someone with teleportation. Second best would be someone with telekinesis. Third best would be a speedster. So yeah, you, basically you just have six different messenger jobs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, and work as a and work as a, 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 a have three pizza delivery jobs just so you can get all that free pizza because you need to eat like a million calories a day. Which was also an homage to the 1992 television show starring um, um, Ship um, yeah. John Michael. But Ship. Um, I yeah, I also was very disappointed in the character and had to come up with a lot of head cannon. 
oh. to make him fit. Oh, you mean the way that he ran, swim, skated? Yeah. Because he, his running form. <laughs> his running form. I mean, I never they ran had, track. The, the director had to go out, must have gone out of his way to have him have that running form. Because there is a scene where he's talking and he's doing stretches and, and he's moving oh. and he's getting ready to run. And it is clear that this is a guy who knows how to run. You know, seriously, he's doing the right stretches. He's doing the right moves. He's limbering up. And then you see him run and he's like flailing. Oh, like, my God. Like one of those Australian water striding lizards. And, it, 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 and exactly. he's tripping over everything. <laughs> seriously, that's what he looks like. <laughs> and you're like, and the head cannon I came up with, it came up with to make it fit is he made the suit himself. And he has no money. So he's like a guy who, who made the suit in his in his little one-bedroom flat. So he has to make the suit out of frictionless material because he's running through the air so fast. But he just didn't get the shoes right. So basically he's running in paper slippers. So everything in the world is, is coated in Teflon. And that's why he's moving like that because he's trying to kind of ice skate well, over just everything. With the way that he ran and his, um, and his interactions with people... It was like, okay, uh, uh, is this the new thing now? Because, like, sexism is very much being tackled in the way it should have been. And the racial issue is being tackled in the way it should have been. So it's like, let's make our comic relief character a little Asperger's. Yeah, Flash Like Strange. Look at him run. And during I'm, the, I'm putting during down I'm putting down the scenes. run thing as purely as bad shoes. Here I'm hoping I'm putting it down as bad shoes. Oh my god! Because like, we, 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 when you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. Once you see it, you will not be able to unsee it. <laughs> and just think the whole time it's like, oh, I, I, I'm running in socks, and yeah. it'll makes more sense. Well, when he was given his Justice League assignment of moving hostages, like just because of all of the stuff that added up to the spectrum and the funny flailing around, I, I really actually that scene I really liked because that was his that was hero his moment. moment. Yeah. That was his moment of like, I because I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. This. I, I, I'm just a guy. I, I don't do this kind and of thing. Like, and he gets the go advice. Go save a dude. Go save and one person. Just one. That's all you have to do. Yeah. And then you oh. know what to do. Oh, I got this. And sure enough, he saves one person. And then it hits him. And all of a sudden, it's, I got to find Bubba. <laughs> and sure enough, he pulls the fucking Forrest Gump like you would uh, not believe. No, but and he. Yeah, but that's his, that's his moment when he, he realizes that he doesn't have to be the dude that punches people. The dude that punches people. He can st- he can just save people. Yeah, and I really do. It's like, dude, we've already got two people. That oh, punch the people. other thing that bugged me about mm-hmm. his character that I really didn't like was the running joke that he has in no sense of direction. Oh, yeah. Because there's actual problems in the movie because apparently he ran the wrong way. <laughs> it's subtle, but it's there. So then he has to run. Oh, this way must be east, and it's like. It's a funny joke, guys, but the whole point of the joke is he can run in the wrong direction halfway around the world, realize he went the wrong way, run back, and it wouldn't make any difference because he's the fastest man alive. Or just finish running around the Yeah, just the run world. around the other way. You know. Um, like, didn't you go out that door? Yeah, it turns out I went the wrong way, so I just came, came I around. I just finished, so yeah. <laughs> um, but I get that Barry has to have something. Now, in the comic books... Again, he is the most boring man alive um, in the comics and for a long time, especially during the Silver Age. The thing that made him a joke with his powers was that he was the least punctual superhero. He was always late. And I like the idea of the fastest man alive always losing track of time. That's actually kind of a cool thing. Um, But no sense of direction? Yeah, no. I'm sorry. It's, It's just... If you're running that fast, you go, hey, I start off in Central City, which, by the way, is in the south of the United States because Keystone is in Alabama. And, um, yeah, like I said, I'm that much of a a nerd. (laughs) So if you're running and after about 30 seconds of running, it's dark, you must be going east because of time zones. (laughs) And if it gets brighter... You must be going west. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's not that hard, people. Um, yeah, so. like, like I said, that, that was just something that, that bugged me. And I think, and again, it there was a couple things they did in the movie for the joke. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, if you're going to, they, I, you could have done it better. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like I said, like if him going in the wrong direction did not affect the plot at all. And again, it's a very tiny thing, but if you see it, that kind of ruined the joke for me. Yeah. It, it, otherwise, if they just kind of made the, oh, I don't have no sense of direction, but have it me- have it be meaningless because it doesn't matter if he walked the wrong way for 15 <laughs> blocks because that was eight nanoseconds. Yeah. You know, he doesn't have to have a sense of direction when he has literally all the time in the world. All right. And uh, yeah. Also, the thing with his costume, I didn't I didn't like the costume, but it took me a while to figure out what all those stupid wires were for. Ugh. His costume's covered with all these w- random wires. It's not like they're, it looks like his costume's held, literally held together with bailing wires, and I was bugged by that, and I thought about that a lot, which I guess the film is good if I'm sitting there worrying about, worrying about the character's costume days after seeing it. But the thing I finally came up about or with it was, was bad because you get stuck in a point that took you out of the rest of the movie. Yeah, the so. wires were bugging me, but I finally came up with the headcanon that, oh, the wires are there to collect and dissipate the static charge he generates when he runs because he makes a point of talking about the static charge he generates when he runs. And as part of his run effect, there's all these lightning arcs around him whenever he uses his powers. All right. So let's uh, now let's uh, finish this up for the last bit before we give our ratings. Um, the final thing, the biggest complaint about the Justice League movie is the complaint about most superhero movies. And I want to talk about that for a little bit. And that is, of course, the villain. Okay. Um, a lot of people are like, oh my god, the villain, he's so cheesy. He's just this big CGI guy that comes out in gray and just mean mugs at the camera and monologues. And um, let's go through <laughs> the villains in the superhero movies just for the past 10 years. We've got Iron Monger, who was played by Jeff Bridges, and he was played admirably. Then we've got, um, oh, Loki. Okay, fine, he set a new bar. But outside of that, outside of Loki and Iron Monger, we've had Malekith, a dude in makeup that did mean mugging and stupid monologues, mm-hmm. Ronan the Accuser, who, let's face it, was played by the actor who does nothing but mean mugging and <laughs> monologues from Harry Potter to The Hobbit to um to freaking Hook. <laughs> I mean, Captain Hook, I think, was his most emotive role, but let's seriously tell the truth. You know, um, um, Ronan the Accuser in Guardians of the Galaxy was just, I am the villain, and I will do villainous things. And then you've got... Um, Who says that? Hmm? Who talks like that? No, I do, but it all depends on how much coffee I haven't had. Um, Sorry, I was uh, a complete different aside. You'll probably have to edit this part out. I've been watching. I've been been watching uh, Stargate. Oh, okay. And there's there's the episode where where Anubis finally makes his big reveal, and he appears before the people of Earth, and he tells them that they will. I am Anubis, and you will receive no mercy. You will be destroyed. And he's going off on his over the top monologue. Okay, so he does that too. No, he does that, and the whole time. The crew Jack is, like, is standing there going, who talks like this? Like, this why, why does he talk like that? And later on, they walk going, yeah, it's like, he was really dramatic. Yeah, ghouled her that way. The big over-the-top drama yeah. queens. And, and, they, 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 and I'm like, yeah, like. Yeah, I mean, we've got um, even Baron Zemo from um, Captain America Civil War. He did his little monologuing, but he was pretty much, yes, I'm doing this from behind the scenes. And I will screw them up psychologically. <laughs> because I'm the villain. Don't you get that I'm the villain? And um, But when it comes to the over-the-top operatic bad guys, they all do the same thing, be it Ares or, um, or most of the ones from Marvel, like Ronan the Accuser. Mm-hmm. Um, Ego didn't quite do it, but there, there were moments. You know, Even as much as I love it in my second favorite Marvel movie, freaking Dormammu. You know, you have come to die, ooh, kind of thing. <laughs> um, so this was a standard cookie cutter villain that was CGI. The thing is, being a fan of Dark Side and Apocalypse and the Fourth World, this oh, yeah. is the one time that fans didn't like when a movie got a character one hundred percent comic book accurate. Yeah, that that is a, <laughs> I, 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 I saw the movie and 
I never once thought like, oh, they're doing them wrong or what? And she's no, he. First of all, first of all, they're bringing. I mean, he arrives by freaking boom tube. The second you see that, you have a pretty good idea who you're de- if, the, the, who if, you're dealing with. Only if you're familiar with the Superman cartoon, the Justice League cartoons, or the comic books. Okay. Yeah, but so, I mean, you you know, you're dealing with someone from Apocalypse. Yeah. So. I mean, when they even talk about when they give the little expo- exposition narration about you know how he is going to turn the Earth into his his. Uh, home world his yeah. the hellscape of his home world and I was waiting to actually say the word apocalypse yeah they didn't but you felt like they were like going out of their way not to say it and, in and I can understand that they're they're doing a pretty good job at the foreshadowing yeah. they they only mention uh his name once mm-hmm. I know you wish that they had said reference to him a little more but I mean we don't it, mean him from the powerpuff girls okay him <laughs> different guy um, you'll know him when you see him. Oh, mm-hmm. that's a moment I want to see. I I may have to wait six films for it, but I want to see that 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 speech between Superman and not gonna happen. Oh, not gonna. It, it was the best way to end the superhero show. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, it was the best way to end the cartoon. So it's not gonna happen. Man. World um, of cardboard. Yeah, I know. I know. And I can it's finally not stop holding back. It's not going to happen. Um, and the thing is, is when he does it, Darkseid's like, <laughs> finally, yeah. someone who's not boring. Well, if you remember at the end of that episode, Superman still loses when he does it. Yeah. That was because, you know, the Agony Matrix. Yeah. Who, you know, I really want one for when I'm babysitting. But, um... But yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's one of those things when they talk about him. Yeah, and again, again, having g- read foreshadowing. Superman, yeah, having, bringing in the bring, you know bringing in the future villains. But having read Superman for as many years as I have, mm-hmm. and Justice League, and like even in the game Hero Clicks, Apocalypse is my preferred team. Like that's my theme. You know, I, I get all the Apocalypse figures. That's all they do. But you know, we've we've established this guy is from. Apocalypse, mm-hmm. and they also establish in his little uh, exposition, uh, it, it mani- yeah, in the little backstory montage of him, that he's exiled and kind of a fuck up. <laughs> so here we have the most incompetent of the new gods showing up, and then even he says, like, if I do this, my exile will be will be over, and I will get to be one of the new gods. So this guy is like. Like, he needs to make this work or he's screwed. And, yeah. So, yeah, he's over the top. He's like, finally my day has come for, like, 6,000 years. He sat around (laughs) waiting for this moment, just writing all the cool shit he's going to say. So, yeah, he shows up. He's over the top. He's super melodramatic. But that's who the guy is. Yeah. I mean, all of the all of the freaking uh, like you said, all the apocalypse uh, characters are that way. Oh yeah, and I am hoping, wishing, and praying that we get Granny goodness because I want to see the over the top abusive grandmother, <laughs> hopefully played by by Kathy Bates. Just saying. <laughs> um, so yeah, so overall, can, can we get casting on that now? <laughs> I'm just saying, let's get that locked in. Yeah. So what I gotta How say is you? like, with all the ups and the downs and all that jazz. I'm actually going to call this movie a uh, I'm going to call this movie a solid flush. This movie actually no, I'm going to call it a straight. This is this movie is definitely a straight. Um it's really good to dedicate like a Sunday afternoon to. So um you know, my love of comic book movies as a genre would say pay full price in IMAX 3D and all that stuff just to make sure more get made, but we're past that now. Now that we've got the superhero genre as a regular thing, I would definitely, definitely give this movie a straight, you know, definitely. Um, I actually thought a little better of it than that. Really? Yeah. Because, because they did, they worked so hard at, well, they didn't work hard, but they did a good job of showing the character growth, showing the characters kind of come into their own and develop. Um, And yes, there were a lot of things I had problems with, but they were not deal breakers. 
<laughs> like I like I said, the, the biggest problem I have is with Barry's running form, and I was able to head cannon around that. And I really think that when they make his movie, they're not going to make him <laughs> such a flailing, like oh, he's probably going to run. Re- they're going to move very hard to make him look awesome on the screen because he's the pivotal hero. Here he was more comic relief. There he will be the main guy. So you know, I'm willing to forgive that, and I'm going to say that it's. Uh, Let's see, I'm gonna say Full House. Really? Yeah. I'm gonna give the movie a Full uh, House. I'm gonna give the movie right. a Full House. Pa- I, I could, I, you could even talk me into into four of a kind because I do not see movies in the theater that often. Okay. And I really did enjoy that. All right. Um, well. I mean, really, the the thing, the detractors that I had. I, mean, I don't know if you have time. We want to go into the things we didn't like. <laughs> but um, I mean, they're they're pretty specific, but they're kind of problematic in the universe. So. Well, you know what? Since we're running out of time, because we did a whole lot of rambling, like ramblomatic and stuff like that, um, I'm going to say we can save some of that for a special thing if uh, we got time to do another recording this okay. week. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we'll talk about that. So, like we said, we got, you know, one straight and one full house coming from mm-hmm. coming from the back in the deck guys. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Hey, and, no uh, problem. This was a lot of fun, and hopefully, we'll be doing a lot more of this. Well, and we will you can be... listen to us ramble. Yeah. And uh, oh yeah, and I forgot uh, the bid P on the SoundCloud. You know the SoundCloud where SoundCloud. you get those things. Remember that's bid P. That would be capital B, little I, and a big, and a great big D. That's right, because sometimes we like giving the audience the D, but not you. You no no not not you 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 yeah yeah we we you. You, we would like to give the whole deck too. So, um, but yeah, that's capital B, little I, capital D, space P. That's bid P at SoundCloud and Instagram and Twitter and the Facebooks. And if they want to talk to you, where could they get a hold of you, Mr. Henchman? Like I said, license to hench at hotmail.com or license to hench on the Facebook. Awesome. See, now you got me saying the Facebook. That's right. The face. Hey, the dude who invented it called it the Facebook. I'm going to go along with what he did. Because remember, <laughs> he might think that people don't like him because he's a geek, but it's not true. We don't like him because he's an asshole. <laughs> and with that, I'm Zuckerberg, man. Didn't you see No, no, I, know. I was just trying to, how do we go from, how do we get here? Hmm? That was another tangent. That's a very, very, very good question that we'll be answering next week. So tune in next week and let your friends know. And hey, same deck time, same deck channel. Oh, yeah. Hopefully same deck time. Or, you know, it's, we kind of operate on CPT here. But um, and yeah, so like I said, um, it's on demand. There is no time. That's part of the joke. Oh, OK. All right. Cool. And we all know that jokes really work when you have to explain them because, you know, I'm really smart like that. No. Oh. <laughs> and over the course of the week we'll still use some of our builds so hey i have to say good evening or afternoon or should i say turn this off and get back to work because i know this is the 21st century we love you guys we'll see you next week bye mm-hmm.